Iowa Democrats have a new leader who says she'll be on a lot of road trips this summer. Find out how she says she'll try to convince you that Republicans say one thing, but do something else. Plus, he is an elite athlete in Iowa, but he faces two challenges that have nothing to do with his fitness. Finding workers and parts. See how he tries to overcome them both to keep his business going in 2021. And in the Insider's Quick Six, a concern about whether the redistricting process will go smoothly. From your local election headquarters, this is the Insiders with Dave Price. History is now complete in the Iowa legislature, at least when it comes to this. In previous years, Republicans chose Mary Lundby to lead the Senate and Linda Upmeyer in the House. Democrats picked Janet Peterson in the Senate. So that only left one caucus, and that's with the Iowa House Democrats. They had not chosen a woman to lead them, but that's now changed. As Jennifer Confers takes over now that Todd Pritchard has resigned as minority leader. I want this job because I see opportunity. I see the opportunity to help Iowans be heard again at the Capitol. I think people like to think I was a red state and I am not ready to give up. So I'm ready to lead the House Democrats to the majority and I'm excited to do so. Wouldn't this job be more fun if it were 51-49 or something like that? It would be a lot more fun if it was 51-49, <laughs> especially if we were the 51. But um, yeah, I mean, fun is relatively speaking, right? I think it's pretty important. And so I'm not ready to, to concede this chamber or the state. So plus I love traveling Iowa and getting out and about, and this gives me an excuse to do so. This is an amazing group of people that I represent and that I work with, um, House Democrats at the Capitol, and they're ready to fight. And so, so am I. So when you take over this position, you have to think both policy stuff yep. and the political side of things, which is gaining more seats, right? Right. So how do you set that path? Well, I mean, I think we often, the most important thing we do is think about how we can affect good policy. That's why we're there. That's what we're there to do. So we think about, you know, how can we make this policy better? How can we try to truly uh, make Iowa better through our work? And then we look at the politics of it. You know, if, if it's a majority and we're not, our vote's not going to change the final outcome, what can we do to raise awareness about a vote that we think isn't good for Iowa? Or can we do to um, take votes that we think speak directly to what our constituents want and need? So it's really not that, it, it can be pretty intertwined actually because policy and politics do live quite closely together up the Capitol. You're making the point that some of the message you wanna share with people is that Republicans run on certain things and when they get to the Capitol, they are passing other things. What, what do you mean by that? I mean, it's been a frustration of mine since I first ran for office um, back in 2015 and 2016 that the things that uh, Republican candidates talk about at the door are very different than the things they do when they get to the Capitol. And it could be things like saying at the front door, we all agree, we need better health care, we need better child care, we need to make sure that small businesses are taken care of at the Capitol. But then they get here, and what they do is they listen to special interests and they make decisions behind closed doors that have nothing to do with those issues. They might dance around the sides a little bit, but the things they prioritize when they're here are different than the things they promise at the door. So wouldn't they say Democrats listen to special interests and just that term is in the eye of the beholder? They could say that for sure. We have proof that they're listening to special interests because a lot of the bills they've done have special interest marks all over them. And so, we, you know, look at the elections bill, for example. We know for a fact that um, outside groups had a heavy role, played a heavy hand in making it harder to vote in Iowa. That's who Republicans listened to, not the Iowans who showed up at the Capitol and said, I don't want this bill. The governor said that her ultimate goal would be to get rid of the personal income tax. Could you support that? I heard that today. I, there's a lot of questions I have with that, particularly when we're saying on one hand, look, the state has just decided to take on mental health, the entire mental health system in the state. State's gonna take it over and fix mental health in the state. Meanwhile, we're gonna cut the budget by about 55%. I'm not sure that those two things can connect. So my question is, what gets cut? Uh, or do the taxes just get passed on to property owners, right? I mean, Iowans expect a certain level of service from their state government. And when you're talking about cutting the budget by 50%, I think that we have a lot of questions to answer before we get to supporting that or not. Uh, on a smaller scale, she's saying in 2022, she wants to further push that down, not all the way to nothing, but she wants to further reduce. Is that something your caucus could get on board with? Again, I mean, I think we all understand that, you know, we, we want to make sure we're paying the minimum that we need to pay in taxes while also getting the services we need from the state. But I, I want to look at the picture of what our state budget has and what needs to get cut. 
again, this mental health concern, I mean, mental health is a huge issue. We hear about it all the time. We know it's a huge issue. I see it in my day job. Um, how are we gonna make an entire mental health system work in the state of Iowa, brand new, and continue to cut revenue? What else needs to get cut? That's where my question comes in. So was it a mistake to go down this path? Should the counties have stayed in charge of funding this? I don't know if the county should have stayed in charge of it, but I do think that the plan was not ready for prime time. So I didn't support the plan to go mental health statewide because I just don't think it's ready. It's a huge endeavor. And if we're gonna do it, I wanna make sure that we're not just shifting resources around and moving around the shells, but we're actually fixing the problem. And I don't see this does that. You plan to travel a lot this summer? Heck yeah, I'm going all across the state. You have said, well, what will that entail? What's the game plan? Well, so I'm gonna to go to um, all parts of Iowa. I wanna do, I'm not writing RAGBRAI, that's for sure, but I will be going from river to river and talking to folks in communities across the state. Communities that didn't vote for Democrats last time, I wanna know why. Communities that did, I wanna know what they need to. And I wanna to talk to our, you know, our legislators, local groups, businesses. Um, I wanna learn more about, you know, rural areas of the state so that I can continue to make sure we're supporting them and uh, really listen more than I talk, as all evidence to the contrary from this conversation. Uh, I've heard you push back on this notion about urban-rural split here. Um, there, there aren't a lot of you representing the rural areas in the Democratic caucus, but what, what is your, do you not think that those have different priorities for the geographical area? They do, of course. Rural Iowa is very different in terms of um, what it looks like, what the daily life is like for Iowans than it is in urban Iowa. But I think the needs that we have are the same and we have more in common than we have different, right? So we all wanna make sure we can put food on the table. We wanna make sure we can send our kids to a good school. We wanna make sure we can have a job where we can go on vacation once a year. These things are the same, whether you live in a tiny town or in Cedar Rapids. And so I think we can come together and find a lot of issues where we agree if we can just make life better for all Iowans. Does that mean that life is the same everywhere? No, of course not. But it doesn't mean that Democrats, just because we might not have legislators from rural areas all across the state, don't understand and know what rural Iowans need. Where was the disconnect there? Why do we not see when we map out where you all have seats, why do we see so few both in the House and the Senate? What's happened? Well, you know, I'm working on figuring that out. There have been no shortage of 2020 uh, <laughs> discussions about what happened in but 2020. But it is longer. It's it gone is. longer than that. It is. And I think that a lot of it has to do with the way we tell our story and uh, what we tell Iowans we have to offer. I think when you sit down with Iowans and you listen to what they need and we tell them this is who we stand for, we have a lot more in common than you'd think. And so that's why these conversations I'm going to be having across the state are so important. I want to sit down with folks in rural Iowa and say, what don't you like? What are you hearing? Plus the fact I think that we've been painted and Democrats have been painted in a way that isn't very accurate and we need to do a better job of fighting back against that. How have you been painted? Um, as you know, Washington DC or big city folks and um, you know, a lot of things that have been out there about whether or not we support the police, things like that. Democrats support the police. Democrats believe in making sure equity is available for everyone. Um, two things can be true, right? And so that's what we're trying to send the message of. It's not as black and white and uh, they really tried to paint us in a national way that um, isn't true of who Iowans really are. When you're out working this summer and traveling, traditionally, you would be, a person in your position would be recruiting candidates for mm -hmm. 2022. You still don't know what that redistricting map looks like, so how do you go try to court somebody to run when you can't promise them for which area that person would represent? Aren't you jealous? Doesn't this sound like fun? <laughs> uh, yeah, that would be a challenge. <laughs> That's certainly what we're going to do. I mean, we're going to have, look, we're going to have conversations. We know that there are communities that um, will stay together regardless of what the map looks like. We can start having conversations there. We're identifying people by precinct so that when maps get drawn, we can look right away and say, you're in this district, you're in this district based on your precinct, kind of. Um, our map is just a little busier right now because of all the potential outcomes. So, uh, but look, there are plenty of people out there who, who recognize that um, democratic values need to be represented more at the House and they're ready to run. We just gotta figure out what they're running for and where they're gonna, where they're gonna fall. So if somebody stops you and say, well, what are these democratic values? Mm -hmm. How do you answer that? We believe in making sure that healthcare is affordable and accessible. We believe in making sure that public education is available and as strong as possible for everyone. We believe in making sure that small businesses are strong and thriving in our communities and that Iowans have jobs that have affordable wages that they can build a life on. She's back in a bit for the Insider's Quick Six, including the politician she most admires. But up next, mastering Iron Man, but struggling to fill positions at his own business.